I need to say right up front to all of you that I am a worrier. I am a worrier, as in furrowed brow, not warrior, ready to do battle. I come from a long line of proud warriors. My French grandmother, she was a warrior. My mother, a very good warrior. Me, a most excellent warrior. My son, a first-class warrior. And now my wee five-month-old grandson, I noted last week, has developed the familiar furrowed brow when he encountered a cat for the first time. Psychologists say in the literature that we may now be able to claim that this is an inherited trait located somewhere along the 15th chromosome. We warriors, and some of you may be part of my tribe, are familiar with the symptoms of this 15th chromosome. We know what it feels like to wake up at 3 a.m. with a worry. We know we are sometimes a worry in the search of a good cause. The long-suffering partners of warriors know what it's like to be asked, are you awake at 3 a.m.? In our house, we even have a particular tea reserved for these sorts of conversations, Lapsang Souchong. My patient husband is not a warrior, but he's learned to adapt. So when I hear of Jesus' declaration of granting peace in this passage, we have read today from John's Gospel, my heart skips a beat. Great. My worry days might be over. But I also know, alas, if this were such a simple solution to this part of a complex personality code, someone would have cashed in a long time ago. Sometimes, when I read sections of John's Gospel, I find it pretty hard going. It is written in such a high register, isn't it? Quite different to the more narrative styles of the Synoptic Gospels. Today's reading is stretched over many chapters in John's Gospel. This is Jesus' farewell discourse, which stretches from chapter 14, verse 1, right through to chapter 17, 26. He had a lot to say. A farewell discourse, a testament. This is a familiar form of writing, not particularly just associated with Jesus. It's a form of writing where the person who is leaving and facing death could write and say what they wanted to say to those who were left behind. We have people that do that today. Perhaps some words of reassurance or some ideas about what it is and how it is important to live a good life. For some families, it was waiting for a final declaration of love that they'd never heard before and had previously been hidden. It is clear from our passage and our reading even before what we've heard today that the ragtag group of disciples needed to hear reassuring words from Jesus. We have read earlier in the chapter that Peter is anxious, he was always anxious, about where Jesus is going, as was Thomas. Philip wanted reassurance that they would be shown the Father fully. Even Judas wanted Jesus to reveal himself more fully. He was anxious. Consequently, Jesus spends much of that farewell discourse reassuring those worry warts that all will be well. They're assured that they won't be left alone. There will be advocates, we read, companions along the way, and they will find a home in Jesus and God and the Spirit. He assures them through his Spirit they will be granted the gift 
of peace. The gift of peace. Jesus does not wish the disciples peace. He offers them the gift of peace. Just breathe that in for a moment. The gift of peace. This is not magic dust peace where woof, all my worries will vanish and my personality and family DNA will be altered or erased forever. This is not peace we read as the world expects. This is not passive peace where I sit around and wait for that Zen moment to descend. This is a peace given by God in Jesus' name, which enables us, the disciples, to live lives of fullness and faithfulness. This is the surprising peace that ironically makes its presence felt in those moments of life when you and I are confronted with truth. And truth sometimes hurts. I'm a member of a book club. I won't ask for a show of hands. I suspect it'll be more one gender than another. There are such excellent ideas, book clubs. I've only been one for a few year, in one for a few years. At our meeting last week, following the Saturday election, our group met to discuss this book. Some of you might have read it. No Friend But the Mountain by Baruz Bachani. You may well know the book, written by the man presently still living on Manus Island, who tells of his time both in coming to Australia by boat and after on Christmas Island and on Manus. It was released section by section via text. It is, in short, a confronting and distressing read, a shameful account about how our nation has treated people such as him fleeing violence and war. I came to the reading of it almost a little bit, I must confess, thinking, oh, what's this going to be like? And found myself almost unable to move as I read it. So picture this, our little group in Brighton Beach, the electorate of Goldstein. After the election, which did not go the way we thought, it was a huge night. This passionate group of women who from the outside look like ladies who lunch. All they wanted to do was talk about politics, injustice, economics, Manus Island, our own shortcomings, the global warming emergency, and how we might change our lives and take some action. It was very churning, there was some conflict, we all didn't have the same opinion, we all didn't feel as though we had really come out on top. But after all that, when I came home, after all the turbulence and the turbulence of the last few days, what was the abiding sense I had? A deep peace. Not because we had solved anything, not because my DNA had changed, not because there are any special powers or goodness on our part, the deep peace was there because I did not feel alone. Who would have thought among the Brighton gals who are not usually known for their radical action, there were advocates to walk alongside and in wrestling with and being confronted by truth, it seemed we had received the gift of peace. In the days that followed, little emails trickled in to the reply all which said much the same from these six women. What a sweet contradiction this all is. In the mess of life, in the loss, disappointment and angst, the gift of peace is found. Just breathe, I tell myself sometimes. Just breathe. Breathe in that gift of peace. Not as the world would give, but that deep abiding peace that comes uninvited and unexpected. 
the peace that is found when the poor are lifted up, the peace that is found when Indigenous people are heard and respected as the original custodians of this land, the peace found when I have the courage to tell the truth, face the truth and reconcile relationships I th thought were just unredeemable. The gift of peace found when I hear those who call out greed and hypocrisy and they are not silenced but given a full hearing. The peace found when we make a radical costly change in our lives for the love of others. It has to be said, Jesus was no therapist. But he did point us toward a radical life of love that transforms and tips life upside down from time to time. So, I will continue to befriend my tendency to worry and I do manage it as best I can. I will probably continue to sip tea at 3 a.m. It's not so bad when you get used to it. My grandson, I suspect, will still continue to worry about bananas and cats. And he will learn to manage that 15th chromosome because that's the cards that he has been dealt. But together, we will breathe in this gift of peace. And we will heed the call that comes in that verse 31 at the end of the reading today. We won't sit still. We won't look down. We won't become immobile. We will rise and be on our way together with Christ and my fellow companions. So breathe today. Take a moment, no matter what is happening in your life, those secrets you are keeping hidden, breathe in the gift of peace and you will find you will breathe out love. And let us, you and I, and those around you, rise and be on our way together. Amen.